So this is our third and final part on mental health. We decided to take a serious approach to the subject, and it's regarding accommodations and solutions in regards to mental health. Do we talk about it? Are we talking about it? What's happening in the school system? Tim, since he's a teacher, he's going to break it all down for us. Right. Hi, my name is Rick. My name is Tim. And this is... Break it down with Rick and Tim. The hell's going on? It's a good question. I'm glad I'm Italian. I'm not white. You kind of are. <laughs> Why does it have to be the big chicken? <laughs> Why does it have to be the big chicken? <laughs> Why do you have to say it like that? <laughs> I was right. And yes. you were racist. It's Britney, bitch. <laughs> I still have a belief that Sasquatch is out there. But that doesn't make me crazy. And you give me that face, and this is my issue with you. Mm. This is a podcast where Rick, a Generation Xer, and Tim, a Millennial, come together and try to find answers to our changing world. Break it down with Rick and Tim. All right. Mm. For this episode, I want to talk about uh, the availability of mental health and like what our infrastructure looks like for mental health publicly. Okay. Are you talking about hospitals? No, I'm talking about like just in general, the infrastructure we have. Well, where does it start, Rick? Where, where, where do we develop a lot of our mental shapes of reality? In regards to problems or development? What? That, in regards to development and problem solving, critical thinking. It's a cultural thing uh, at home, at work, at school, our social circles. Uh, it's everywhere. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at what professional help we get in regards to being social. What was the last class you had that talked about socializing and how to talk to people? Never. Right. Were you ever taught? Never. Why not? Because we don't offer they don't offer classes how to talk to people in school and college. Sure. No, well they do. I remember taking a, a class persuasion and leadership. It was great. We that, just okay, went to class and we argued with the teacher. All that's not time. normal. That's not part of general ed. No. You know, I took a speech class years ago. How to talk in front of an audience. Okay. But that's not answering the question. Sure. Were you ever taught? Like problem solving, like what happens when you get in an argument? How do you no bring yourself you down? You have to win. And, you must always win. Okay. Okay. Always win the argument because that's strength. You know, losing okay. an argument's weakness. Hmm. It's very American. Yeah, that's the thing, right? And there's also a certain shame in regards to mental illness. Is why we don't talk about it, right? And I think that's the reason why. It's not discussed in school settings and how to talk to people and how to communicate effectively. It's right. Maybe now it is. I don't know. It's getting there, maybe. My experience in, in the public school system, because I was a teacher um, in our state, uh, I took a like a three-quarter year long, long-term sub job at one of the hardest hit by poverty schools in the state and they had one mental health person as a teacher or as a as counselor, a, as a counselor, as a school counselor out of how many students? Well, they're probably like two, 300 students, but she was like every student in this building was dealing with some stuff. It was just, it was crazy. And she just had lines of kids. So it didn't end just constantly kids roaming in and out of her office because there were constantly kids going through mental health crises. And she would, at the end of the day, just be in her office crying. It was awful. She was... It was awful. Way um, overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, by... overworked. It was like um, trying to bail out a sinking ship with a spoon. That's very reflective of the current status of mental health in our state. Yeah. Elsewhere. Before we started recording this show, I looked up how many mental health hospitals there are in the state of Oregon. Nine. Sounds like a lot. Over 1,500 beds. So, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but sounds like a lot. But apparently there's quite a big percentage of Oregonians that 
suffer from some form of mental illness. I think the percentage was, from what I saw, 27%. Do you think it has something to do with the weather? Because of being vitamin D deficient? Could be, you know. Yeah, especially if you're a brand new transplant. Sure. My first winter here three years ago was very difficult because I can imagine so. the sun was up for 10 minutes and then it's gone. I had to change the way I slept because coming from Las Vegas where it was sunny for a good 12 hours out of the day, having sun for six and a half, seven hours was a change for me. So right. I had to wake up earlier to enjoy the sun. And then on top of that, sometimes it's just filtered through a nice gray scale of clouds and rain. And yeah, I can deal with that because there is some kind of sunlight coming through. Mm-hmm. But it's not enough. The factor of um, about the seasonal depression here in Oregon. Yes. It's called seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, seasonal affective disorder because it's just sad. Yeah, and I experienced a little bit. I wasn't sad, but it definitely I need to get one of those therapy lights. Yes. Which, which helped. It does. They do. Yeah. Uh, everybody I've talked to out here, like once they get one, they're like, it's a miracle. It's like summer all over again. And it's great. I have one in my classroom. But I haven't used it since that first year. I've been able to adapt pretty well. Nice. Yeah. In this school of need, high need, there was one mental health counselor. Um and then there were there were other like mentor groups that would like contract with us and like send a mentor out and they were inconsistent and it sucked because then you're dealing with the trauma of an inconsistent mentor mm. with a fifth grader in all their other traumas. It sucks when like you got this fifth grader who's like, Oh yeah, I'm waiting for my mentor and their mentor just never shows. And you're just like They're screwed. The f- tell you. Yeah, they're on their own. Right? Welcome to the f- world, kid. Disappointment. Set yourself up. Do you think social it media hurts. has played a factor in depression and what we're facing now in regards to mental health crisis? The internet, social media. Absolutely. I think, I think so. Especially with younger kids. Absolutely. Well, and here's why because you have instant access, it's like a chat room all the time. You're always linked in. Hmm. Trademark. With your picture, Don't with us. videos, with everything about everything. you right there for the, everybody in everything. that chat room to see. Mm-hmm. And you can't take it away from like a student because then your relationship is this person who took away a piece of them. And here's the other thing it's not that they are overstimulated, they're understimulated. That's what a cell phone does. Because if you just, you know, take a moment to look around, think about all the things that are like stimulating you right now, as far as like your vision and your hearing and all that stuff. Now compare that to just looking straight at your phone. It's not a lot, not a lot right here. Right. Right. And so our students, when they get overstimulated, retreat into their phones, that's where they go. And the problem is, is that from there, that's a whole nother source of anxiety. That's another and, rabbit hole. And a whole thing. And they go, just, no. they just go down it because it's a safe place, but it's not it's a safe, safe place. That's safe, the problem. Right. I remember 10 years ago feeling freaked out in regards to social media and what complete strangers who I'd never met before at the time were saying about me in regards to Bigfoot. And I was at work, and I needed to be on my A game because my tips were dependent, working as a waiter. Mm -hmm. It was a busy night inside that Hard Rock restaurant, and I was like, I can't let these people influence my work life. I have to turn this off. I have to disconnect and learn to deprogram and not give a F what these strangers were saying about me on the internet, which I can't control. I can't control the internet, but I can control how right. I react, mm-hmm. and I can can control, for the most part, my work environment. And I had a, I struggled for about an hour until I really got into the groove and figured it out and made sense of it all and got through my shift just fine. I felt better when I went home because sure. when I went home, that's when I was able to deal with it. Pick and choose your battles. Right. Very important, especially dealing with your mental health. Right. And for some people, you know, it, it, and that's kind of those the things when we talk about like what triggers people and all these words and things that, you know, you got to be gentle around people. Uh, yeah. But the thing is, 
is, and, and this is my kind of philosophy when it comes to like my teaching is we have to approach that and not ignore those triggers. So like a lot of my students, um, I will see them starting to like amp up and I won't like activate them is the word I like to use. I don't like to use the word trigger. Uh, it's overused. Well, trigger is overused, but really what you're doing is you're, you're just directing, you know, an emotional, you know, explosion really. So like I see it happening. I know it's gonna, it's gonna happen and they're looking for a target. And so I just say, Hey, I see something's bothering you. And that's enough to just go bam. And they just boom right at me. Right. Just because I'm acknowledging that it's there. Mm. So how do we train our students or our, our young people or our old people for that? Right? How do we train everybody to uh, recognize um, when they are anxious, when they are um, projecting their anxiety out towards something that doesn't deserve it? Right. I get yelled at a lot by my students. Um, and in, and sometimes they say hurtful things, but at the end of the day, I know that they're just shouting a bunch of their anxiety at me and it's not personal towards me. And they just need somebody that that they trust that can take that kind of a beating, which sucks for me, but is good for them. You developed a thick skin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I developed an understanding and empathy for why they're doing it. Right. They're stressed. How do we then, as a community, approach that situation? Because I see it, you know, in my job, but I've also seen it in in grade schools. I see it in a lot of grade schools. We're relying on the teachers to be these mental health professionals. And there's a, a line that a lot of people say that teachers can't cross because, again, it should be just the parents. But at the same time, uh, look at how much time they spend with us. True. Right? And what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to teach them, you know, books, history, math, things of that nature, what we can, you know, test, or we're supposed to teach them to, you know, think critically, uh, to problem solve, that kind of stuff, right? Now, one may say, oh, well, we're doing that anyway with, you know, this experiential math and theoretical math and the common core, and it's just, well, it's not well implemented. And it, it does, it still doesn't approach, you know, the mental health part of it. Now, a lot of schools are, are putting it in on their own. And they're making it a part of the curriculum. So there's, I've experienced it, uh, like restorative justice, like curriculums, like tribes and things of that nature. Tribes? Tribes. Tribes. Tribes is uh, a book, a curriculum on teaching like community within the classroom, doing like community circles and things of that nature. And it works. It has results. The most frustrating thing for me is to see a student go through a mental health crisis in a school and the school not have a system in place to handle them. You can talk about, uh, you know, what the discipline looks like in a school. They'll have all sorts of buzzwords and such RTI and what's RTI response to intervention and these tiered things that they do. It's like, here's what happens when a student does this, this is our response and stuff like that. And they, they'll have it. But the reality of it is, is that none of that really addresses the, the catalyst of the problem. The what cause, is causing that yes. student to blow up? What is causing that student to lose their mind? And it's if, broken. It, it, it's putting a, uh, it's trying to, to deal with the fallout and not deal with the cause. And if that is not figured out in a school environment, it's going to carry over into the work environment. Yes. Well, and it, it will part, part of it is, is, uh, you know, and I'm not, not saying that I'm the perfect parent and I'm not saying that I have all the right answers, but like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a co thing that we have to do. Uh, as teachers and parents, and not just parents, but like as a community, like everybody has to step up and and help, you know, each other figure it out. Because that's the problem. Like our students, my students go home and they're in chaos, right? Some of them live in a house that's never quiet. They don't get any sleep because there's just constant coming and going. And there's no sense One of our of, neighbors is like that. Yeah, right? And so there's no sense of community. There's no sense of, you know, what there's no sense of routine. There's no sense of no moments of calm, no moments of calm. Part of the problem is those that experience that way of living. Like they're like, no, that's normal. That's fine. That's okay. We want to perpetuate that. And that's, you know, 
needs to be looked at. Because the, the other thing too is, and we have to be very careful here, is saying, well, we don't want to, you know, be, sh- you know, telling people that the way of their life of going about it, a little bit up. We don't want to be telling people that the way that, that they're going about their life um, with, you know, high stress, high anxiety is wrong because that's not necessarily true. That's just the way that, that they're, the dynamics of how they work. But uh, we also don't want to, 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 to say that the, what we're doing is right and what we know is better than what you know. All I'm saying is we need to recognize the stress that exists within that space. Right, because not everybody is equipped to handle that. Exactly, kind of stress. some people with strong personalities can, right, and right. probably contribute to all of that noise, for lack of a better word. Exactly. But then some people who are softer and more introverted and more empathetic and process things differently, right, are vulnerable to that chaos. And that is a lot of young kids. Yeah, and it's the the idea that they'll learn to deal with it, right? Well, yeah, they're going to learn to deal with it, but they're going to develop a lot of really bad coping skills along the way because nobody's teaching them how to deal with it. That's the problem. So where do we get our coping skills from? How do we as a community agree on what is, are those coping skills? How do we implement a, a curriculum or a, a way to teach that to people? That's the tough part. And there's different kinds of mental illnesses out there that aren't noticeable right away in development. Uh, l- the learning disability, autism, is noticeable from a young age. Whereas... It can be, yeah. Paranoia schizophrenia mm-hmm. develops later. Right. In the late teens, the 20s, and 30s. Right. Well, and a lot of mental health disorders develop because of, like, stress. True. Right. And anxiety. Mm-hmm. Stress and anxiety. And even in utero, they've done the studies, you know, of, like babies who have been born from like refugees mm. and their mental health versus uh, a baby that's born in a stable country. I was suffering anxiety when I first moved here because of the people that lived above me in the apartment I was living at for five months. And that was just, oh my God. And then when I moved here, my new place, after that five month <laughs> torture chamber, the first night I slept here, I was constantly looking at the ceiling because I was afraid of the pounding, the incessant pounding and thumping that I experienced at that other place. I, it, it took a day for me to like realize I'm in a safe area. I'm okay. My dogs aren't freaked out. I'm not freaked out. This is a good thing. And I had to process that literally in that tone of voice, talking to myself. You just had to learn how to exist in a place that didn't have high anxiety. Right. So right? you yeah. weren't hyper vigilant all the time. Right. And it's a bit of blessing. Yeah. And now with my new neighbors, it's a mariachi band constantly playing. So yay. That's all. That's racist. Is it? No, it's real. That's what's going on here. It's okay. I would rather deal with uh, Selena being played 24-7 than the sounds of bowling balls walking across the ceiling. Oh, man. So back to mental health. I can feel it. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Right? We've, we've got you, you going. We, 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 I need a tranquilizer, too. All right. Give me a gummy. Oh, my God. You have them. I know. That's my in case of emergency. Mm. When it comes to mental health, that, that seems to be the center of the problem in Portland when it comes to our homeless population. Everybody seems to say that it's a big mental health problem and uh, we need to do something about it. It's It was one of the main topics of our election this last time. And part of the problem is how much empathy do we hold for these people? Because at this moment, right, we're kind of being overtaken by homeless people. And yes, they are part of our community. They are allowed here. It's not a crime to be homeless. It's not a crime to be homeless. But at the same time, they're creating a lot of waste. They're creating a lot of crime, which sucks to say, but they are. And hijacking our neighborhoods. They are hijacking our neighborhoods. And that's the problem. Like when I moved into our neighborhood, like I paid for this spot, I bought the house, right? And I can kind of do whatever I want within reason on my property. Now, I'm not going to leave my bins out there. 
you know, 24 seven, because I'll get a citation and I'll have to pay a fine. I've been threatened before for having <laughs> what I was, no, I have, I got here. This, yeah. Um, I, well, when I was redoing my yard, uh, when we first moved in, I had a, just a pile of yard debris sitting out kind of on my property and it was visible from the street mm. and the city told me I had to move it or I was going to get like a $300 fine. Wow. And I was like, dang. So I moved it. But the homeless residents around here that uh, leave their shopping carts and trash and such all over the place for us to clean up, they're not paying taxes. They're not uh, contributing. contributing. And that's right. the problem. There needs to, if you're a drain. Well, yeah. And we're paying for it, right? Because we have to pay for that cleanup. We have to pay for... We, what's funny is, if you think about it, we paid for all of the tents, because during COVID, the government, the local government was giving out those tents, and they still are. So we're paying for the trash that they're leaving. They go through a lot of tents. That I, I don't think is sustainable. And so there needs to be uh, like a balance. Because you know, again, you have to have the empathy with people because they are going through, I believe, a mental health crisis because drugs do that to you. Right. And so there needs to be, they're, they're in it and, and they're not going to want to come out of it. A lot of them won't. So somebody has got to reach in and get them. Right. So how do we do that? I remember in our first episode dealing with mental health, we were talking about the homeless issue and the drug issue and the, the characters that live in our neighborhood and uh, migrate through our neighborhood and I suspected that there's a lot of drug-induced mental illness, and I did some research on it. I used the Google. Good for you. Yes. I did my research. The correct term is drug-induced psychosis. The, the term that is incorrect is drug-induced paranoia schizophrenia. And I was wondering, maybe that's what's happening to our little pop princess, Britney Spears, because her whole life, conservatorship, everything, family drama is right there in front of the whole world to see. Right. And if Britney is in need of care, which I personally think she is. It's Britney, bitch. Her being verbal and vocal with what's happening to her and what's happened to her shouldn't be viewed in a negative tone, whereas her family, her sister, and those that have preyed upon her continuously, even to this day, are contributing to it. They're bad. Yeah. That's wrong. Well, and if you look at the Harris is an interesting case study because essentially what happened with her, if we break it down, is she had been kept sheltered and in this like state for so long. Uh, she had no way to mature. Was like it emotionally. 13 years the conservatorship was crazy? Sure. And in that time, I mean, there, there's just, it, she's so limited as what she's exposed to that she has no way to grow. So in her mind, she is like developmentally still very young. She's and a so teenager. We have to give her time to grow. And the problem is, is that when you're a teenager, you bounce back a little easier it needs to be done with some care here. Like she needs someone to kind of help guide her through this growth process. Otherwise she's, we're going to read about her in the news. You're right. Her father uh, claimed in, I think 2009 that Brittany was suffering from early onset of dementia. Hmm. And I don't know. I don't trust anything that man says because he's the villain in the sure. conservative storyline. Sure. Drug induced psychosis. We've seen that with, the character that we call Oseo because I've seen him sober and I've seen him like, right. And we've seen him he's in, on a different planet altogether. Right. And the reason we call him that is because that's what he shouts yeah, at constantly, all hours. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And he is someone that does not want to get help. Right. He'll accept food and water from mm-hmm. you, but he will not do anything to better his life. Better once. Yeah. It's hard to feel compassion. Well, you can feel compassion and empathy, but you also need to set boundaries. That's kind of where I'm at with like how I teach my classroom. Like there are certain things that uh, I won't allow, right? And it doesn't matter how bad of a day you're having. doesn't matter what you're going through. 
if you cross that boundary, I'm going to call you out, period. And so that kind of needs to be said there. Like, you know, we need to, but, but here's the thing, going back to our infrastructure, we need to have an infrastructure in place. And then we can say to these citizens, look, you need to contribute if you want to be part of this community. And so go get clean and get on the right track. It's your civic duty. I believe, you know, a, a, another state is doing that. Mm. And I think it's somewhere in like New York or Jersey or something like that. I'm not sure. I need to do my research. New York law allows for involuntary hospitalization when a person's mental illness prevents them from providing for their own basic needs, as well as when they present a danger to themselves or others. Have you seen those videos? I think I sent them to you from Kensington Place. Maybe it's the zombies. It's in Philadelphia. And it's just like just street Zombies. after street of people just shooting up. Yep. Dozens of people just yep. out there in the public, on the curb, just broken. Fall out from our pharmaceutical rush of opioids. This brings me to one of your uh, let's quiz Tim, but I'm going give to you, give you the answer here. Mm. Give me the question first. Why do we not have mental hospitals anymore? It deals with what you just said. The modern deinstitutionalization movement was made by was made possible by the discovery of psychiatric drugs in the mid twentieth century, which could manage psychotic episodes and reduced the need for patients to be confined and restrained. Right, that's different than the opioids that I was talking about, though. Oh, is it? I think yeah, the opioid crisis I'm talking about. So what you you were looking at um, in Philadelphia, I think. I'm not entirely sure, oh, yeah. but from what it sounds like is like heroin and fentanyl and painkillers. Like that's what causes you to just blah. And, and that uh, is the, the, the gateway to that is like opioid use. So that's your aunt who broke her leg horseback riding. And right. You had mentioned that in opioids. previous episodes, like the, yeah. the slippery slope. Or, you know, the football player who dislocated his arm and was given opioids or the, math teacher that was given opioids for his tooth extraction. That's me. And I said no to those opioids. Prince and his back pain. Uh. Right. And look where that led. <laughs> that's right. Well, I mean, it, and that's how it begins, right? That and, and that's why opioids were such a big problem because they didn't care about your socioeconomics. They didn't care about your, um, your race. They just, they, you were prescribed them if you were in pain and the more that were prescribed, the more money the pharmaceutical companies made, the more money the doctors made. Wow. So it was just everybody, here's the candy. Would that help my meniscus tear in my knee? Yes. Oh. Yes, but you, it's, it's very addicting. It, I think it takes like three days to change the wow. like chemicals in your brain or something like that. Hmm. Does something to you in three days. Is Tylenol with codeine the same thing? Yes. I think. Codeine, yeah. I think so. It's an opioid of some type. That's a good thing, though. That Tylenol coating, that is some nice stuff. Yeah, because it gets you completely stoned. That's why people like it. Yeah. That's why they get addicted to it. And then they want to keep that feeling going, and they can't get a prescription for it, but they can get heroin or fentanyl on the streets. Wow. And then that gets some even way higher, and then you're like, I got to have more of that. And it just becomes your life. And then you're on the streets in Philly... Shaking around. Have you seen that? Yeah, I have. You can show it right here. Boop. Oh, Kensington. Oop. Hit, hit my microphone. Kensington Place or Palace? Kensington. I have no idea. Kensington Palace. It's Kensington Avenue. Kensington Philadelphia. Avenue in Philadelphia. So, Philadelphia, Kensington Avenue. Virtually all the homeless virtually under Kensington all the Avenue. Homeless. Have one thing in common, and it's heroin. Yeah. There it is. Wow. Does it tell you what was the beginning of all that? No, but it says a few in the camp are not injecting. They are smoking crack or K2, Mm -hmm. synthetic marijuana. K2. Ooh. Those that are addicted to heroin are shooting the drug in the morning at 8 a.m. They are using it 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So let's go back to how would we create a system like that what would that look like a good a a community that has a solid healthcare system what would that look like that that dealt with mental health i personally don't know i think we would have to research other countries that are 
uh, low in mental health problems like maybe, I don't know, Denmark, Sweden. Why not use the experts that we have? This is the this is my problem that I have. This is my problem that I have with our system. Is we have nobody, experts? Of course. I'm an expert. Look at what my job is. My job is to take the students that the other schools, the public schools and the other alternative schools, just are at the end of their ropes with and make something out of it. So my job is to get these students and... The first thing I ask them is, why are you here? What did you do to get here? Because that opens up that door for honesty. I know what I'm dealing with, right? And for a lot of those students, nobody has that conversation with them. Nobody says, what's going on that's causing your education to become not a priority? And for some of our kids, it's, oh, well, I'm taking care of my three younger siblings. Because my mom is a drug addict, uh, and my dad is nowhere to be found. Uh, for others, it's well. Uh, uh, there's a lot of anxiety between me, my family, and another family right now, and we're like ready to go at it, gang wars, right? So everybody's just on edge everywhere, all the time, ready for a fight. So that's something. But knowing what they're going through allows me to have that empathy for them and say, okay, when you come here, you can throw some of that at me if you need to, and we can talk about it. And I tell my students this, I say, you, if you come in here and you want to, whatever you're talking about, I'm going to help you process. Um, and sometimes they'll want to do that and sometimes they won't. Mm. And I'll say, great, if you don't want to process it, then you don't, then, then, then let's focus on the education part. Uh, and we'll talk about it later. Um, but the, the thing, and this is the problem, when we have kids that come into the classroom, they're not ready for education yet. They need to process something first. They need to deal with something. They need to go through somebody and, or somebody needs to go to them and say, hey, what's, what right now is your biggest priority? What is the thing that is overtaking your life so much that you can't learn? So what does that look like? For me, in the ideal world, every classroom would have a teacher and a counselor both. Even like in public schools? Even in public schools. Like the ones I went to in yes. California. Well, because public schools are supposed to have a mental health person anyway, but just having one or two is not enough. There needs to be, because because here's the thing. I remember in those schools too, and this still happens, is that mental health person is supposed to go around and do like classes and stuff and, and do all of that mental health stuff. But one teacher one teacher to teach an entire school and that teacher, and she's not even a teacher counselor. That counselor is also responsible for helping all of those students process all of their emotions and all of their traumas and everything that's happening in the world right now. That is an impossible job. And so we need either more counselors or we need to properly train our teachers to deal with that and to uh, recognize when, Education is not a priority for a student. Have you ever perceived a student come to class that would be on an illegal substance? All the time. And I'm not talking about marijuana. Yes. Wow. It's interesting because there's the ones that will like sit and then they'll drift off and they'll catch themselves. Well, that um, happens to me all the time. <laughs> sure. But this is like a serious level. Of- this is like when you're having a conversation with them, like you're oh. talking directly to them. Like, we're having a conversation right now, and you would just kind of... Ooh. Yeah. Can you tell by their eyes that they're dilated? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Big old pupils. It's, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll call them out on it, too. I'll be like, bro, you are, you're, you're drifting on this conversation, bro. You need to ease up on the... Uh, oh, man. Uh, whatever you're on there. And I mean, you know, and I try not... I don't call them out in front of their friends. That's the other thing, too. Oh, like, like I'll just... Except for pot. Whenever somebody comes into my room and they smell like a tree, I'm like, you need to turn your jacket inside out or something or get some, you know, dryer sheets because you reek. You, that's the thing. Like, if you're going to see everybody in my, uh, all these kids smoke pot. The thing is, they just need to learn to do it responsibly. I'm sure that's a chronic thing everywhere. Sure. Even sure. teachers smoke pot. Well, and 
let's be real here. Let's let's go go down to the nitty gritty of it. When I was in high school, I was given all sorts of drugs. Adderall, I think, was the one that I eventually landed on, right? And that is a hardcore drug. Yeah, it was given that by by a doctor. Okay, because I just I was having trouble focusing. Now that didn't necessarily address the issue. I mean, it, it did to an extent, but they misdiagnosed me because they just wanted a diagnosis. He's not doing well in school. Give him some Adderall. Um, it was kind of like the the blanket to drug. Right, and, and it is now. As a matter of fact, we have a shortage of it. I was never given that. No. Retlin. Ritalin? Yeah, I can never say it right. <laughs> Retlin. And it's a stimulant, right? And so it's basically prescription Coke light. And we give that to our kids. And that makes them real anxious, uh, but it also makes them really focused. And and there's, uh, how can you fault a kid for saying, okay, I don't want that. Instead, to deal with my stuff, I want something that's going to be a little more calming. It's going to, you know, help me see the perspective a little differently. And it's going to help me mellow out. I would prefer my students be on pot than chalked up on Ritalin or Adderall or some of those drugs because there's, there is, there's a difference. Now I do have some students that like are extremely ADHD and they need that drug. It does something different for them. But for a lot of our kids that I find that have been prescribed these drugs, it's like, come on kids, you don't really need that. Weird Adderall side effects that you might not know about. Adderall changes neurotransmitters in your brain that can cause violence, decrease self-esteem, depression, and extreme fatigue levels. So if you're experiencing these problems while you're taking Adderall, you should consult your medical doctor. Do you think today America has a problem with over-medicating our kids? I think so. That's not to say that medicating our kids is bad because there are some that need it, but I do think we over-medicate. Going back to what our infrastructure looks like, there needs to be, I mean, because there needs to be a change, right? It needs to be a drastic change. There needs to be something that uh, changes how our education system works, because that's where I think that this is the solution to the problem, right? We, it's a long-term investment, but this is where kids or this is where people develop their coping skills. So we need to teach it to them in grade schools and in high school. Now, I do that in my school, and we're hoping that filters out eventually into the public school. We'll see. But once we get there, then we have that base. Now, as far as dealing with the people that we have now, we need to invest. That's that's it. Money. Because we you're you're right, we don't have enough mental health like capacity. And on top of that, we uh legalized pretty much all drugs. Well, we didn't legalize them, we decriminalized them. So now when a homeless person is out on the street having a what's the proper term, Rick? Drug induced psychosis. Uh, police can't pick them up and say, we're picking you up for this drug violation, taking you to a mental health place. They can't do that anymore. They just have to say, well, they're there. Walk it off. Right? That's it. There's nothing we can do. There's no accountability there. And that's the problem. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think we should be putting people in jail for drugs, but... I don't think we should just be allowing it because the other thing too is it it does drain our community. I find needles <laughs> outside my house. We live in the city, but still. I was there with you when you found that crack pipe. Oh, we have yeah, we found a crack pipe too. That was fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the first time I've ever seen one up close. Really? Yeah. Welcome to Portland. Because I'm from the bougie side of town. I'm from Beaverton. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Get the hell out of here. On our podcast, we've had a lot of fun making fun of Donald H. Christ, the former president. Mm -hmm. There is another president in our past that is probably number two in regards to being a villain. Oh, there's also Nixon. Oh, there's quite a few, I'm sure. But in my lifetime, well, Nixon is part of my lifetime. These are all heroes of the right. That's true. That's true, because when I was born, Richard Nixon was Mm. president. In recent years... In the past 30 years, Ronald Reagan, aside from what he did with HIV and AIDS and lack thereof, right? he is to blame for the homeless population in the state of California when he was governor. 
When I lived in L.A., because I grew up in L.A., I had heard stuff about it, but when I was growing up there as a kid, we didn't have the internet. Sure. And it wasn't part of our public Yeah, courier pigeons system. and <laughs> telegraphs. News and at 11, literally. News at 11. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So now with the internet, I was able to Did they play some... the national anthem at the end of the night? Yeah, I remember that. Ronald Reagan signed into law the Lanterman Petrus Short Act in 1967, all but ending the practice of institutionalizing patients against their will. When deinstitutionalization began 50 years ago, California mistakenly relied on community treatment facilities, which were never built. So when you say mistakenly relied on them, so basically what they did was they said, we're going to get rid of our institutions and we're going to rely on all these community places that are going to be built. But then we never built them. We just dropped the ball. That, that reminds me what you said earlier about the kids uh, who needed help, who would go and not get the help. Exactly. Same thing. Exactly. Right. But on a much so, bigger scale. So here's, so California's, and, and that's kind of the problem. Uh, and that's problem with the problem that I see in schools and the problem that I see everywhere right now is that there's that it's, we're not going to do this. We're not going to institutionalize our kids. We're not going to punish them. We're not going to do this to our... We're not going to punish our, 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 our drug addicts. We're not going to institutionalize our drug addicts. Um, we are going to hopefully build some mental health places for them, and it's going to be great, and it's going to be wonderful, and we'll have a, a ball, and we'll raise money for it, and you know maybe they'll get built. Maybe they'll get built. Opening in 2029. But we've gotten rid of the institutions, and that's the important thing. But maybe we'll build these, you know, maybe we'll put this infrastructure, and there's always these maybes we'll do it, and may it's in the plans. We're going to do it. It's there. It's coming. It's coming. It's a coming. But it's just, and it reminds me, it's, it's a, something that I've told my students this Many times. Don't quit your goddamn job until you find another one first. Don't burn that bridge, yeah. Right? Keep what you're doing. Go out and look. Find your new job. Get it secured. Sign your papers. Go give your two weeks notice at the other place. Because you got to have a guarantee from one to the next. And that's the problem. And now we've done that. We got rid of our institutions. We got rid of all the things that we don't like about dealing with mental health that's not pretty. Uh, but we didn't really build anything else. What happens when there isn't anything else? The overabundance in the prison system people get released. The consequences of this became clear quickly. The number of mentally ill people entering the criminal justice system doubled the first year after that law was signed. So instead of sending them to a psych place, we're sending them to prison or and, jail. And as the jails and prisons emptied, homelessness jumped. Unlike the rest of the U.S., where homelessness has been relatively flat, California's homelessness spiked in 2015. Now, approximately a quarter of all people experiencing homelessness in this country reside in California. And we think we have a big wow. problem here. Just, yeah, that's right. California's bigger. Wow. Um, right. So they got rid of their institutions, and instead of building these treatment facilities, they just threw them into jails. And then once these people got out of jail on the street, they had no place to go, but the street. Right. And they didn't get any treatment while they were in there probably. And so they were just longing for the day that they were released. So they could go get more drugs. And that's probably what happened. Or they were probably doing drugs while they were in jail. In 1991, I was 20 years old. I was working as a waiter in a cocktail bar. No, I was working as a waiter in a Denny's mm. in Santa Monica, California. You were a Denny's waitress? Yes. Graveyard. It was a lot of fun. Did it for two years. Denny's was good money. That was the first time I ever met a person who was homeless at the age of 20. Mm. There were these regulars that would come in and sit at the counter at the bar. They had money. They weren't on, they weren't on drugs like our neighborhood vagrants. Is that the, the correct term to use? Vagrants. I don't know. That, Homelessness, yeah, vagrant, yeah. Sure. That, yeah. So uh, these guys were living in their cars in the parking lot at Denny's, and they would spend all day sitting at the counter at Denny's and 
would pay for their food and they were cool. They were part of my work environment and not in a negative way, not like what we're experiencing now here. Sure. And that was, of course, 31 years ago. Okay. I don't know if the Denny's isn't there anymore. It's a sure. building. It's been remodeled over the years. But I, the drug epidemic, I can see how it's exploded over the years. And it's a whole different uh, environment in regards to homelessness and mental health than back then. Sure. And now it's time to Let's Quiz Tim. Okay, here we go. Tim. Rick. What state has the worst accommodations for mental health? Florida. Mm. Oregon. Is it us? Ranks worst for prevalence of mental illness. I was going to say Oregon, but I was like, ah, Florida. But no, that makes sense, actually. You know what I know why I almost said Oregon is because of where our schools rank. Mm. Pretty bad. The ranking is based on self-reported rates of mental illness, substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts. And like I said earlier, in Oregon, 27% of adults report suffering from mental illness. That's six percentage points higher than the national average. Oh, wow. Why do we not have mental hospitals anymore? Because Reagan. Mm. Was it Reagan? The modern deinstitutionalization movement, movement was made possible by the discovery of... Oh, psychiatric, psychiatric drugs. drugs. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so we no longer need to keep an eye on people because we'll just drug them. Yeah. That no sounds Bellevue. real good. You know, it's funny. Um, the cuckoo's nest. Do you know what I'm talking One about? One flew over the cuckoo's One, nest? Yep. My grandmother used to work there. She was a nurse. Oh, that was an actual place? Yes. Down it was in, just a movie. No, it's down in Salem. Uh there, I don't. They rebuilt it. They, I don't know. There might still be parts of it, but I think they tore it, the old oh. building down. Pretty sure they did and rebuilt it. And it's it's like a prison. It's insane. It's like a and your grandmother compound. worked there. She did, uh, and she would tell us stories about like walking down like the the aisles of like patients and just the terrible things that they would say to her and such. It was terrible. And you know what one of her jobs was? And she would tell us about this and it freaked us out is she uh, had to hold, had the tongs to hold people's tongues when they were doing electroshock therapy. You don't want to choke on your oh tongue. My God. That was her job. <laughs> right. Can you imagine that? Jesus. It's a Jack Nicholson movie. Yeah. And I didn't know it was based on a real thing. Yeah. Was your grandmother's name? Nurse Ratchet? No. Tim. Rick. Why is depression so high in Oregon? Is it because Because of the weather. Because the Californians keep invading. One factor is the state's rainy climate, which through the reduction of exposure to daylight can cause seasonal affective disorder. And And the the other other is is Californians. Believing in Bigfoot. There it is. It's a joke. I know. But is it? (laughs) Now, you might know the answer to this, but I want to know if you can think of who is the good guy here. Okay. Before mental health care was defunded, who um, tried to sign mental health care into law before it got defunded? So there's a good guy, and then there's the bad guy that did away with it. I'll give you a hint. Who Who was before Reagan? Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. We're going to go with Jimmy Carter. And that shows how much Tim knows his history. Yeah, you get this. Although President Jimmy Carter signed a new mental health legislation into law in 1980, which promised to systematize care networks and provide free mental health care to all, his successor, the evil Ronald Reagan, repealed it. Can you imagine? He repealed it. Sure, but can you imagine if that went through and became a thing? We'd be having a different discussion right We would now. be having a different discussion. It'd be he, completely He different. repealed it in just one year later, defunding the project. God. Speaking of presidents, mm. do you think, and I'm being serious here, I'm going to refer to this person by his real name. Okay. Do you think Donald Trump suffers from mental illness? Um, if we go back to our definition of mental illness from the first episode, uh-huh. I think one of the, one, I think maybe more than one of those nine narcissism things definitely yeah, has gotten his way because here's the thing. I don't think he's able to, uh, 
like understand when he's wrong and empathize. Right. Zero. Right. It's all about him. Right. I don't think he knows. I, I just don't think he can. I don't think he, he sees it. Right. That's why his main motivation that is just, Prince. is just to win. Right. I have to win. It doesn't matter what happens after I win. What matters is that I win. I'm always the winner. I have to be the winner. Joe Biden. Do you think he has any mental health issues? Maybe. He's also old. Barack Obama. I don't know. Here's the thing. That's it is the, here's the thing. You can't just look at someone and objectify and them. Objectify them. There needs to be more. That's the that's the other thing. Like President uh, Bush. Do I suffer from a mental health problem, Rick? Rick, on the surface level, does it look like I do? Do I? I don't think so. You seem pretty normal. You've always been well put together. I do. I have narcolepsy. I don't know what that is. It sounds like you have sex with dead people. Um, no. No, it, that's necrophilia. Yeah. Ooh. Narcolepsy, uh, basically basically what it means is that I'm tired all the time. Uh, my well, brain, Welcome to being an adult. Well, no, but this is like my body is literally trying to put myself to sleep on top of all the stress of being an adult. When I was a teenager, I would like wake up at like 3 p.m. every day. Basically what I did was I went and I took a sleep study and they discovered that my body is creating a, uh, like an antibody for the hormone that wakes my brain up. So my brain doesn't fully wake up. So you're kind of like groggy? Yeah. Like after, like when I take a sleeping pill in the morning, I wake up, I feel like I'm in a zombie state. Maybe that, maybe that. I hate that feeling. That's exactly it. So I wake up every day with a hangover is what it, what it is. Do you still do? Yeah. Every day. And there's nothing to fight it? Oh, sure. They can, uh, what my, I have been given all sorts of drugs. What's the best Stimulants. One? What's the best one? They all suck. Caffeine? Caffeine is, you know, a lot of narcoleptics will just drink a lot of coffee or energy drinks. When I was over in Korea, they gave me a little shot, little energy shots. Does that work? Me. Not really. It gives a little boost, but I've it never... doesn't get rid of the brain fog or fatigue. That's the oh. thing. I can get energy, but it's not going to solve any of like the... Sometimes I feel like my, my, I've just been like, it's just full of cotton. So how long does it take for you to be out of that state of fog? 15 minutes, an hour? I have been out of that state of fog maybe four times in my life. No, no. What I mean in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You wake up. Yep. You Obviously, you feel when you're kind of in that zone. Uh-huh. How long does it take for you to be up and running? It's maybe happened four times in my life. <clears throat> I don't, think you're, I, I, I don't think you're understanding what, I, what I'm telling you, Rick. I never come out of that. You don't? No. So wait a minute. Like right now, I am tired and I am keeping you're myself still, awake. But you're still in that zone. Yeah, I'm kind but of why groggy. Would you yeah. Oh, kind wow. of that groggy, I'm still waiting for the fog to clear up and for me to just be like awake. So only four times in your life? Maybe it, about four it, times in my life. Mm-hmm. So when it dissipates, mm-hmm. you're like, wow. Yeah. The birds are singing. The sun is out. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I don't want to go back to sleep because I know I'm going to wake up back in the fog. Was those four times induced from a drug or just natural, your body just somehow? Just so, well, yeah. The clicked. somehow. It's just somehow clicked. Wow. And that's the crazy part. I've never heard of this before. <laughs> yeah. And that's a mental health yeah. Issue. It really is. Well, yeah. Well, because look, brain fog, brain fatigue, grogginess all the time. You think every human being has something because we're such complex organisms? Sure. Living in a it's overly a spe- complex it's, 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 society. It's, well, and it's a spectrum of how well you can function, right? When one of those things becomes affected, then you got to kind of rein it back in and it might, you know, push something right. else out. But it's a balance, right? You have to balance. You find your balance. And that's the trick. Like, I found a pretty good balance dealing with the sh- bullshit that I have to with my health. Uh, wow. Right? And so you just got to cope. I've known people in my life that had been bipolar who were over-medicated, and I saw the results of that medication giving them the shakes when they were never like this. I'm not over exactly They were- Sure. It was shocking. Oh, I've had the shakes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I've, I've known people who are seriously uh, schizophrenic, mm. not drug-induced. It's for real. I remember one time they changed my medication to venlafaxine, and I got super paranoid. I was like, oh, my God. 
I remember coming to the realization. I'm like, oh, I've just I like, and I calmed myself down, but I still felt the paranoia and like the the rush of it. And but I was like, you know, I know this is just drug induced. Hmm. And then I stopped taking that drug because I didn't want any more paranoia. And what's funny is that like I was told that the paranoia would subside. And it just never did. I think I took it for like two months straight. And I, at the end of it, I was like, nope. No, isn't there some marijuana that make you paranoid? Sure. Mm-hmm. That's not sativa. That's sativa. Well, oh. any of it will make you paranoid if you take too much of it oh. or sometimes. But Indica. I mean, sure. One of them is going to be like, and, and it is getting into pot. But one of them is going to be kind of an upper. One of them is going to be kind of a downer. Sativa is a downer. Indica is the upper? No. Ah, so it shows you how much I know. Right. Reverse. Sativa is the upper. Yeah. Indica is the downer. Yeah. Calm, relaxed, creative, excited. Whenever I've smoked or ingested cannabis, it's always been the bowling ball effect. I always felt like I was just sinking. Indicas. Those are all been indica. I don't think I've ever experienced the upper version of marijuana. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll do that for the next episode. Let's get Richter high. <laughs> Let's get Richter stoned. Uh, <laughs> how long would that take? Not long. No. You think we did a pretty good job I think we covered it. Mental uh, health? Yeah. Homelessness? Right. Bigfoot? Coming down to it, if we want to kind of bring it back down. Our issues? Yeah. What it comes down to is we don't have the infrastructure yet. We're getting there. We're starting to invest a lot of money. A lot of money has gone into my company that I work for, uh, and they're dealing with a lot of mental health stuff. A lot of money is going into, I have a buddy who's a peer support specialist and they're getting tons of money and they're hiring, they're expanding. And that's what we needed to do earlier, right? We needed to provide all these things. Now, here's the other thing. We also got to clean shit up. Right. And so we need to provide, I'd, I'd much rather my tax money go towards providing uh, a shelter, you know, or a little tiny home, whatever that looks like, than it would be to clean up somebody's, uh, you know, trash and their hut all the time. Yeah. So we should probably get on that. Now the city is disappointing because they spend all this time talking about where they're going to do it, but they never actually do anything. Yeah, and like now the city that we live in in Gresham, there's only one homeless shelter, and right. it's for women. Mm-hmm. Now, do we have a lot of campers out here in Gresham? Not like we have seen towards Milwaukee and Foster Road and that towards right. downtown. But we have a lot of migrating, right, uh, transient people we do. coming through because of the bottle drop. <laughs> right, we do live right by a bottle drop and right by the max. And um, for people that don't know what a bottle drop is, that's where you go and take your recycled yeah, you cans recycle and your cans. bottles. You get a deposit back, five yeah. cents a can, or in Washington, ten cents, I think. Anyway, um, we have a lot of migrating transients. Is that the proper word? Probably not. Vagrants, yes. Vagrants. Uh, probably, and and one of the reasons why is because Gresham has a no like they can't you can't camp on the street. And so whenever there's, whenever there has been a trailer or any sort of vehicle that rolls in, they're very quickly moved, moved along. Yeah. And they do have like a response team that comes out to deal with those people. Yes. And I have seen like vans come through when it's like going to be super hot or super cold and like ask like the homeless people if they're, they want to get, I remember they, they stopped by, uh, Oseo and asked him if he wanted a ride to a cooling place, and he denied it. They gave him water, and that was it. Hmm. So there's there's stuff, but it's not enough. It's, again, like uh, the poor mental health person in my school that I was at early on, just way overwhelmed, way too much responsibility, an impossible job. Trying to plug... A river with your finger. You know what's ironic? In our city alone, there's like five churches per square mile. So many churches. And yet, I'm not a guest or a parishioner. I guess that's the term sure. to use. But I'm going to safely assume there are not all welcoming of people who are in need of help that are on the street that have no place to go. You're probably right. You know. Now there's some are. There's that one church on division 
that JP, the homeless mm -hmm. specialist, told us that we'll feed them once a day a hot meal. Right. And that's great. I wish all these churches would do that. Here's the thing, though, Rick. And you have to remember this. Yeah, you, you can't make it too accessible because if you know that you can be on the street and still get a hot meal every day and do your drugs, what incentive do you have to get clean? When churches start to do that, and you see it happen, uh, they essentially turn themselves into a soup kitchen. And then you have all these, and they're normally set in a neighborhood. Then you have all these homeless people starting to set up camp around in the neighborhood and they take over. And then the people who live in that neighborhood, that community complain. So we have a church right down the road here, like two blocks. Let's say they start giving out hot meals every day. Well, then people are going to start camping over here because they know that's where the food is. Right? So it's going to just attract that. And so that's the problem with it though. So how do we, where's the line then where we say, if you want that hot meal, like how do we, now we're holding it in front of them and we're dangling it in front of them. And now we're bad guys all of a sudden. I just had a solution. To What's the your solution? Oh, Rick has, this is going to, this is a good ending to our, our, our thing. Cause this is, this is, this is how we're going to end it. We're going to, you know how we say tax the churches. All right. I say, let's tax the churches. But if a church provides housing and accommodations for at least 20 homeless people. That's a lot of people. 20 homeless is a lot. I would even say they, five. Then they don't get taxed. A tax is empty. But it, I mean, well, here's the thing, though. Like, again. What do you think? Think about that. They're, they're all, these tax all these churches that aren't being taxed are influencing our law, our government. Right. In a profound way that it's affecting women's bodies. Okay? Federalist Society, the Supreme Court. I've said I've made my case. Sure, yeah, of course. So, well, we know, so we know there, are, but we know we know that religious institutions are political and all that stuff. So let's tax them. force these motherfucking churches to provide shelter for the homeless or get fucking taxed. God damn it, Richter's. Seriously, this is pretty. Th I'm, this is a profound idea. You don't want to be taxed, church? All right, provide accommodations for at least twenty homeless people, and maintain that. If you sure. don't maintain that, then psh, you're getting taxed. Now, here's my question as I'm coming back to Earth. Well, welcome back. No longer. No <laughs> longer. Off. No longer flying up there. What percentage of churches would choose to be taxed than to provide know. for homeless? I don't know. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, because I, I know... Uh, I I know people who provide stuff like that. My, my uncle provided uh, uh had a homeless guy living outside his building and eventually was just like just move in bro um and be my security and he gave him a job kind of assimilated him into his place and it worked out yeah for a while yeah then he shouldn't have been taxed right and that's the thing like it, why does why do we have to stop at churches why why not give that in churches are part of the problem well, we, in my point of view. Okay, so yes. I think go if we want to, because uh, again, churches, they have their purpose. We do have a lot of them in our community. <laughs> Five per square it's, mile. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's yes. a lot, and it's a lot of people trying to, uh, from my perspective, it's a lot of people trying to, to, to grab hold of people and tell them kind of how to live their lives, which some people need. They need that guidance, and it shows uh, our mental health crisis because what better what better to who better to turn to than god in a mental health crisis well if you're right? going to aa you right. turn yourself over to christ and there you go all let that god stuff carry your problems right? all of that um and so religion plays a very big part in our mental health system now uh is it always correct? Well, no. There's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with that. Like I we could go back to mental health and how uh one of my, you know, childhood friends grew up, and he grew up as a homosexual. Um, and you didn't mention him in the first few I episodes. Did. And when his the their show. version of mental health is to go to their pastor and get their counseling right. there, and he his his response was, "Oh, he's doing it to spite you, and it's is 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 he's hurt." And so what that did was just perpetuate the problem. Mm -hmm. It didn't help them at all. It didn't help them process that. It didn't bring love back into their family. It brought a lot of anger and hate and anxiety and just more mental health bullshit. As I come back down to earth. Um, yeah. I mean, I think 
churches play a big problem. Not uh, churches don't play a big problem. Churches play a big role in our community, and we need to recognize what that role is and reevaluate how we, you know, take their funding in terms of tax. Because here's the thing: I could go out and be like, "Look, I'm a church." And then I got to choose how I spend all of the tax money that I want. But at the end of the day, my parishioners are still using the roads around me. They're still, you know, using all the facilities. I'm still tied into things that need taxed. And if I'm going to be political, which a lot of churches are, then we need to be part of this community and pay the same taxes as the rest of the community. Or provide shelter for homeless. Or provide shelter for homeless. I think I have a pretty profound solution to the problem. I haven't heard anybody else mention that. Have you? No, but I think you should push it. All right. Vote for Richter. Vote for me, and I'll show you my wee-wee. Oh, my God. (laughs) That's gross. Well, okay, so... uh, uh, I mean, this. There's. I mean, there's a lot to look at too. Is when when it comes to like actually housing a homeless person, what would that look like? Does it have to be an actual house. Would we provide them little shelters that they could put on their property. Would they have to house them in the place? Would they have to pay for you know all the utilities and everything? Or is that person required to get a job and to uh, like maintain a certain civic duty? Right. So it goes back to what do we want to do with these people? We have to find a place to put them. Okay. An option would be churches. The other option would be to build you know camps. Another option would be to convert giant buildings that we've had. Uh, you know, like our, we had a, a, a prison that was built, but never opened that they can converted into a homeless tr- uh, center with a treatment center in it. And that's great. So Tim, go ahead and tell our listeners and viewers what the next topic is on break it down. On the next break it down with Rick and Tim, we will be covering the riff topic as an RIFT. No, R-I-F-F. What does that mean? I think we're just going to say what's on our mind. Uh Uh-oh. What's on your mind, Richter? Well, number one... Dicks. (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) All right, so we're going to do Let's Trigger Richter. Why? Why do you want to set me off? Because... The Brazilian politician who just lost. Ooh. Do you remember who that is? I don't know his name, but I know that uh, he's following in Trump's footsteps. Yep. Bolsonaro. He lost, um, and he tried to pull the Trump thing, you know, stolen election, blah, 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 and he's doing the same thing, basically. Where is he right now? Oh, he's in, uh, I believe, like Florida or something. Or he's, he's in the United States. Steve Bannon met with him mm. bef- right before his supporters stormed the Capitol. And then Trump sung his praises and their supporters' praises. What are your thoughts on that? It's a boys club of corruption. Yeah. And nobody should be taking notes from Donald Trump because he is a failure. The one... That was not a failure Was a son of a bitch in Germany in the 1930s And we all know who he was He succeeded in doing ultimate evil Right And paid the price for it Right, but Kanye would tell you he cured polio And that's good Do do you feel that I'm being free And I'm thinking free I, I I actually don't think you're thinking anything I think what you're doing right now Is actually the absence of thought And the reason why I feel like that is because, because Kanye, Kanye, you're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to believe whatever you want. But there is fact and real world, real life consequence behind everything that you just said. Kanye West is a very talented performer, singer, songwriter, but he's also suffering from his mental health. Something serious is going on with that man. And unfortunately, he's in the spotlight, just like Britney Spears. But Britney Spears is not a Holocaust denier. So these men are all desperate. And they're surrounded by yes-men, sycophants, who want a part of the action. They want to be them. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to sell their soul for it. Uh, 
I think it's contagious, this social media corruption, taking advantage of everything, this conformity, this strange This, if you keep saying it, if I keep saying it, it'll be true. If I keep saying it, it's yes. true. If I keep saying it, it's yes. true. If I keep saying it, it's true. Right. And if I keep saying it, even if it isn't true, it becomes true. Right. So I'll just keep saying it. Yeah. Um, I recently saw the movie American History X, and that movie pretty much tells us what was going to happen. This movie was made in 1998. And what we experienced over the past six years with the insurrection and MAGA and the white supremacy and Patriot Front and Proud Boys and Oath Keepers and all that. Rocky Dinga. It, it was all spelled out in America History X. And that movie came out way too soon. I think if that movie had come out today, it would have been the perfect moment. So what did happen in American History X that is so parallel to what's happening now? The scene where the Roger Stone, Steve Bannon character is talking to Ed Norton, telling him about the power of the internet and how they're going to take their area nation and go national. You see, things have changed since you've been gone, Barry. You talk about organization? Wait till you see what we've done with the internet. We've got every gang from Seattle to San Diego working together now. They're not competing anymore. They're consolidated. Meanwhile, there's the American flag waving with Hitler's image behind it. That is exactly everything that we went through. Right. And and then if if we look at the actual facts here, there was a moment where the government, Trump's administration, weaponized or at least was attempting to weaponize the internet. I believe one of the generals called them their digital soldiers. Right. So it very much is exactly what was pre- what was pre- predicted right there. QAnon is because of the internet. And then we have companies profiteering off of this, like Facebook and Twitter. Well, and if we think about it too, like where does radicalization happen oftentimes for anything now? It starts at home. But but where primary you, socialization sure, starts at home. Sure. It's the seeds. It's the seeds. But where does it where where do, where does it like where do you find those echo chambers that that radicalizes people? Well, now it's on the internet. Right, now. the internet. Well, and it's it's always been, because, I mean, you look at uh, Al-Qaeda, like the, a lot of those people are drawn in because of the internet, because of the information they've been getting from the internet. They radicalized on the internet. Sometimes they stay home and they do radical things there. Sometimes they right. come to, uh, you know, the, the jihad. Uh, but it's the same thing as MAGA, right? It's... You know, everybody, let's go to the Capitol on January 6th. Okay, so some people do that, but then there's the other people who stay home and they do things at home that, you know, perpetuate the MAGA thing too. So it's it's not just white supremacy. It's all the radicalizations. It's just such a And it was always there. It was always there under a rock. But instead of the internet, before the internet, they had underground newspapers, underground sure. magazines, and would be distributed and passed around the city. And all it takes is a few people to get their hands on that. And, oh, I know who's going to like this. And then the, mm-hmm. the membership grows because of that. It's slower than the internet, but it was still there. You know. And then they didn't have a political figure like Donald H. Christ giving them a platform to continue their hate. Right. Right. Mm. Well, because it, it would take a certain special someone who says, I don't really care about your morals as long as you just give me your vote. And stand back and it. stand by. Right. Goodness <sighs> gracious. And it's like, OK, we get it. Those are your supporters. Uh, tell them to stop. Yeah. That's all. We don't tell them to stand by. Good God. Mm. <laughs> like we get it. They're your supporters. It's okay. You can have them as your supporters, but understand that we're going to have a yeah. problem because like they perpetuate trauma within the community for their gain. That's their thing. Do you Anymore. think DeSantis is going to protect Donald Trump in Florida? Sure. You think he will? Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It depends on, on where does it, because here's the thing. DeSantis needs the Trump supporters. So he might just let, you know, Trump just, he might try to distance himself from Trump. I don't know if he's going to like necessarily like make it like a, like an involved thing. I don't think he's going to come out and say, I'm going to protect you. Um, 
I think he'll just try to distance himself and say, I'm going to let, you know, whatever, do whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you mean protect him? When it comes down to Donald Trump being indicted, is the sanctimonious going to protect him in Florida? What do you mean protect him? Keep him from being arrested? Yes. He can't. It's, it's, it would be a federal thing. DeSantis does what he wants. Yeah, but he's not, he wouldn't be able to protect him. He just wouldn't. Okay, well, that's good. He, I don't think he has the power to do it. Mm. It was a good discussion. Yeah. No Bigfooters were harmed. No. I actually don't think you're thinking anything. I think what you're doing right now is actually the absence of thought. 